It's that time again, another episode of the Change Talk interviews, and today I've got a cracking interview. This time it's with success coach, author and presenter Michael Neal. Now Michael has been helping people get what they want out of life for over 20 years now and has created a massive following with people who want to achieve success in a fun and enjoyable way rather than slogging their way through and working every hour. Michael has also in recent years been helping coaches work more successfully, creating coaching apprenticeships and creating the Super Coach Academy with a fantastic lineup of fellow coaches presenting. Once you have finished enjoying this interview, you can check out Michael Neal out at supercoach.com and also listen to him on his radio show at Hay House Radio. So, once again, I hope you enjoy the interview and take lots of notes. Um, so, you're uh, known by most people as a, like the coach and author and host of the uh, successful Genius Catalyst Cafe. Um, but I'd like to start with um, you talking about the early days um, as a coach when you were first getting your, your initial clients. And I was just wondering whether it's a, like, it was a slow process. Uh, did you have any early goals that you wanted, such as like you wanted to get X amount of clients within a certain amount of time, or you wanted to generate X amount of revenue? Well, I mean, you know, for me, when I started, I, I started doing sort of one-off, almost more therapeutic sessions. Right. And I charged 33 pounds uh, uh, for, a, I, it was like a, most sessions ran sort of 90 minutes to two hours. Mm. And I was just so excited to get to talk to people and see if I could make a difference for them. Mm. And I know that sounds that like all noble. I don't really mean it in a noble sense. In a way, it was quite selfish that I just got off on it. Mm. And, and, and so I didn't really have, I mean, I'm sure visions of sugar plum fairies must have been dancing in my head. And I must have thought, well, why would they not? <laughs> exactly. So pretty. But, but I, I never really had goals in that sense because I never really intended this to be my profession. Right. Um, you know, I was an actor. I was actually a reasonably successful actor. And I just loved talking about this stuff. Mm. I loved talking to people and seeing if, you know, if I could help them. I, I, I had a miserable certainly not really childhood but my teenage years and early early 20s were so rough mm. that, that that I was sort of so grateful to have gotten through it that the idea that I might be able to help other people get through it with a little bit more grace than I had was just thrilling to me okay um, so in fact I would even say that the I, I can trace the times where I've been sort of off track in my career mm. it's the times where I've tried to set goals and targets so the times where you kind of just went went with it, uh, with, yeah, I went with what boy? What would I love to do? Mm. And, and and then later, because as, as if you stick with it long enough, you get to the point where people start offering you things, mm. and to, and to sort of sift through those offers with a filter of do I want to, mm. as opposed to is this part of my career path? Is this part of my plan? Will this get me to the next level? Um, for for me, and this is. For me, but you know, I, I teach a lot of coaches through the academy and, and over the years through other means, and I, I find it a pretty consistent thing that we get in our own way by thinking that there is a journey and a path and a place to get to, instead of following our, our curiosity and our excitement and, and, and our enthusiasm and seeing what unfolds. So, was it your curiosity that brought you then onto coaching? Or was it, or was it? Well, that, that well actually, that? I mean, it was interesting. What it what it actually was is something that turned out to be one of my great successes, but at, at, at the time I thought it was my biggest failure. Um, and it was a client that I saw for agoraphobia. And I, it had seemed to be a successful session, and I got a call a couple of days later from, uh, from the woman asking me to call her, and I had just been cast in my first equity play in Manchester. Mm. And and I didn't call her back. And I thought, boy, I need to, if I'm not going to be accountable to the extent that I'll follow up with somebody if they want to follow up with me, I have no business working with people. All right, okay. 
so for a year and a half, I still taught uh, and I still wrote, but I didn't, uh, I, I didn't see clients. And then I got a call from her about a year and a half, two years later, and, and sort of went to see her out of guilt uh, and met her for lunch. And, and she unfolded a story about, you know, her, her fiance was with her and he was there to thank me. And there were members of her family who wanted to thank me, um, you know, because uh, this is just going to ring in the background. I don't know how to make it stop. <laughs> but, uh, oh, hang on. I can do this. I can, I can stop it. Um, but... But it really was an eye-opener for me that the reason she'd been calling and I'd made up this whole story about how I shouldn't be doing this kind of work was mm. just to thank me and to tell me about the huge breakthrough that she'd had. And I, and I was so sort of moved by that that I, I jumped back in uh, to, to the coaching work and, 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 and got excited again about what was possible. Right, okay. So, so when you first um, started getting back, back into it, um, how did you handle any setbacks and like disappointments? Were there, were there times where the clients oh, really, went really badly? Really badly. <laughs> oh, when, I, when I first had my newsletter list, I would, I would, I would sulk like a five-year-old whenever somebody unsubscribed. Like I'd want to call them up and go, "Why did you unsubscribe? What's wrong with my newsletter?" Um, you know, it would have gone, gone down well. I'm, I'm sure. sure. <laughs> talk them back into it. I mean, there, there was a lot of neediness and ugly, desperate smelliness about what I was doing. Oh, good Lord. Uh, I'm You're sorry. About that. That. I uh, normally am a little better prepared. Uh, but actually, I'm normally on the phone, so the calls just don't come through. <laughs> and I'm going to turn this off. Um, those of you listening, this is where it gets really interesting. Here we go. Phones are off. Uh, ask, ask me another question, Aaron, even if it's the same question again. I've totally lost it. <laughs> um, your, uh, your early um, setbacks and... and uh, um, yeah, and I, I mean, you know, for me, it's difficult to have setbacks unless you think that there's somewhere you're supposed to get in a certain time frame. Mm. Um, certainly disappointments where things that I thought were going to work a certain way didn't work. Um, and And... And I think there's a there's a sort of a natural persistence that comes when you're not pursuing a goal, so much as following a an inner prompting. Right. So in other words, if I was trying to get somewhere outside of me, and I was struggling to get there, that would be frustrating. That might, you know, lead me to get more and more frustrated until I wanted to give up. Hmm. I kind of have never been doing that. I, I've been somebody that, for whatever reason. I realized pretty early on that the only way I was going to have a meaningful life was to was to follow the inner guidance and the inner prompting, right? And and, and see where it took me. And so consequently, when I've been disappointed, it's because I allowed myself to get caught up in expecting it to get somewhere mm. instead of just allowing it to unfold. Okay. So so when you look at that um, that philosophy that you have and the, the, the things that you talk about um, both with your clients and in your books, who have been some of your influences that have uh, got you to the level that you are today? Well, it's been interesting because uh, I've had a lot of influences that I now look back on what they teach and it's, it's not my thing. Mm. But at the time, it was exactly what I needed to hear. Um, so one of the first, uh, in fact, I think the first book I ever read about anything remotely alternative was uh, Shakti Gawain's Creative Visualization. Right. And uh, I was just at university, and I, this whole idea that you could control the universe with your mind was very exciting to me because I did not live in the universe. It wasn't, um, it wasn't my friend. And, and so I got very into that. I, I, I went down the Silva Mind Control path and Tony Robbins and... And, and basically, anybody who promised me I could control stuff, I was into. <laughs> um, and, and I did that for a while. And, and I just got to a point where I realized that being more in control wasn't much better than being out of control. It was a little better. Mm. But it was, I felt just as stuck. Like when I got more control, I felt more dead. Uh, there was less spontaneity. There was less... Um, there was less life in my life, right? And and so what w w for me the the, the next wake up call from that was was coming across a show on uh, QED in the UK uh, called I Want My Little Boy Back, and it was about this family from Birmingham who had an autistic son. Mm. 
they went to this place in Massachusetts called the Option Institute. And it was it was remarkable. My wife and I watched it together and we were in tears. And I, I called them the second the documentary finished. I, I went online, found their number, phoned them, and and they said, um, Do you have do you have special children? Hmm. I didn't realize that was a euphemism. And so I said, Yes, two of them. And that that must be very difficult for you. And I said, Why? And we figured that out. Um, but I, I hopped on a plane three days later um, because I just thought if what they're doing really works, mm. I, I want to know about that. I want to understand that. Because for me, I, I'm only interested in doing this if it really makes a difference. Yeah. I'm only interested in working with people if it really is going to make their life better. And, and, and while a lot of stuff sounds pretty and is very exciting it doesn't stand up over time. You know, I, there were a few times in the 90s where I hit a point where I thought, boy, if all this stuff I was teaching was so great, my life should be a lot better than it is right now. And I got that it looked fine, you know, and, and, but, but, but I knew that it wasn't. And so for me, it's been an ongoing search. So this thing called Option, uh, which, you, you know, um, option.org is Barry Neil Kaufman's website. That's where I first went to study. Um, but there's also the Option Method Network. Uh, is, it has a lot of option practitioners. And MandyEvans.com, she's one of my favorites. She actually teaches on Supercoach Academy with me. Okay. So, just, so, so that, so that um, options method um, forms a large part of um, kind of what you do with your clients today. Well, well. No, it doesn't. But it, it, it was a gateway for me. Right. Because it got me out of the world of trying to control life to make myself happy. Mm. In other words, that was the first thing I came across. And there's plenty of other things out there that say this, but it was the first thing I came across that could meaningfully show me that my happiness was not dependent on my getting what I wanted. Right. And and once I opened up to that, that opened up a whole other world to me. And and the work that sort of is the biggest influence on my own work now is is the work that it's usually called the three principles sometimes principles based psychology used to be called psychology of mind or health realization right okay. and, and that's the work that really took took the sort of insight i had back in 1999 that there was something very wrong with just getting better and better at spinning more and more plates mm. as a life strategy um, and turned it into something tangible that I could not only sustain, but I could teach. Okay, cool. So, so the, the clients that you um, see at the moment compared to when you first started, um, that trying to transition when you were charging by the session um, to um, charging um, more of a premium of what you do, like in the six monthly and twelve monthly programs. How <clears throat> how did you form that transition in regards to? You know that that change in price and getting the clients who are more prepared to pay that price as opposed to ones that were. Um, there, there's, there, yeah, there's both an inner queue and an outer queue, mm. and 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 I I'm I'm aware that. Well, I'm I, I, aware might be the wrong word. I'm concerned that my answers are going to start being boring because a lot of the time it's down to I just knew, mm. and I I so trust that inner knowing. That I I follow it because even if it's in air quotes, wrong. It's always led me to a better place eventually than trying to do things right. So there is a huge element of I just knew when to change the pricing. Mm. But there, there was also the the.